Uh, question. I recently completed CCAD. Uh, do you think the next best step in the terms of career is to study CKA? Or do you think Linux qualification is uh, better and weak there? I mean, that's a great question. Uh, it's kind of a long answer, though, so <laughs> let me prepare an answer here. The short answer is I don't know. I can tell you well, I'm, I'm trying to do the same thing myself. I need to try to get certified in CCAD and CKA. I have to take the test before July or they expire. And I'm going to go ahead and take those things. Uh, but I don't know the order or how essential they are. So, first of all, I've heard the CCAT is the easiest one to take. I hope so. I haven't taken it. I don't know. Um, and then I think the CKA would be essential. I don't really think the CCAT without the CKA is worth getting. But the CKA depends on CKA Unix without having a strong, strong Linux foundation. Uh, I saw someone training for DevOps the other night, and she was struggling because she didn't know the, sh the schmod command. She just set up this amazing Docker Compose thing and had all this stuff talking, but didn't know schmod. So, you know, that's, I think that could be a real significant hindrance. Um, when I got my job, it was specifically for cloud native infrastructure engineers, and they said, we not just DevOps. They specifically wanted people with systems experience. So I think that answers the question. I started then from newbie level, so I did the famous Mushmad Muhammad course on newbie. I don't like that one. I also did exercises on the GitHub page, CAD exercises, exercises in the CAD book. Uh, finally, I did exercises on the site. You get two free web terminals. So yes, that's the ones I'm going to do. Those I'm going to do those actually pretty soon. Is that you just don't know when you're going to stop, right? So if you're going to take a break uh, and study Linux and try to certify or something like that before you go for the CKA, it's like. You could go forever in Linux and never know when to give it up. So we need a list of the minimum things in Linux you need to know and infrastructure before you Great take advice uh, from Tani Fa uh, that you should, you know, master the workflow perhaps. And, and to me, that means creating a bunch of virtual machines. Uh, that's why I'm making fluff and then installing you know, KubeADM on there. And then, I mean, if you, by doing it that way, you actually build it up from scratch. You can possibly read the source code for Compute ADM. I think that's the way I'm going to prepare. I don't know that that's the way everybody should prepare, but I love that way. So set up some virtual machines, put Compute ADM on there, and then read the source code. Quelle distribution Linux me conseilles-tu? Arch ou Fedora? Je suis sur macOS. My suggestion is to stay on macOS. And that's because you need to stay proficient with desktop uh, stuff that you could use on the job based on what server you intend to work with, not what desktop. And the reason for that is because it's a luxury to be able to use Linux on your desktop, uh, but it's mandatory to know Linux on the server. Uh, you usually will be forced to use Windows or Mac at work. And sure. Fedora, uh, easily Fedora. I would actually not use Fedora, though. Um, I would do... Uh, personally, I would do Rocky Linux. That's my favorite right now because it's my favorite uh, Red Hat based uh, distribution. And uh, Arch is, is fun if you want to learn Linux, but it's irrelevant in the Noting industry. Also, how awesome Mac is. Uh, I, uh, the company Apple is not so awesome, but, but Mac Unix is the officially the largest Unix distribution on the planet. That is not hyperbole. It's true. They got they, they are actually registered as Unix. So you will experience things that are Unix based, not yeah, just Linux. Based. I made a blog. I mean, I made a Zettelcast and I'm recently about this. You should learn Windows on the desktop. You should learn Mac on the desktop, and you should you should learn Linux servers. And anything that you learn, anything that you learn related to desktop Linux is a fun hobby thing, but it's extra. It's not That's required. A very fair question. Why don't I have a website? Uh, I've had several websites over the years. I was Nike's webmaster, and the website every time i have a website the the content is so unbaked because it's you know it's it's very loosey goosey with zettelcasting kind of stuff that people are always holding me to a higher standard they want me to maintain it maintain my website and keep it up to date we actually talked at length last night about how to put our notes up without having people link to stuff that we can't change our mind on and how to make a deprecated kind of thing where we say hey this this information is deprecated but it's still here for reference and linking you know what do you do with that are going i my i've, I've crossed over like 1300 zets and this is not even counting the data i have from skills tech and other things so i am going to be publishing it all that's why i'm finishing command box so i can make the tool to do that publishing um and that will be soon how soon i i, I would probably tell you it's going to be before may the 4th because 
people are going to want to read this without just going to the GitHub site all the time. I, that was kind of a stopgap measure that lasted more than a year. Uh, I always intended to be able to publish in my own static site generated things at some hey, point. Which Linux did I put potentially you know, on the on the on the desktop since I use it all the time for Ubuntu car because you know for embedded systems it's a big thing. Arch is definitely better for embedded. So if you're picking a laptop Destro or or some sort of for that, then I would go Arch. I know Arch, right? Um, and, but Arch is really uh, the best pick when you want to understand Linux and when you're dealing with embedded systems. I totally, fully agree with that. Uh, and I used Arch to build my own uh, pen testing right, distro. So. Do not pick Arch if you want your desktop to just work. You're going to be fucking around with it all the time. And that's what people, that's what you want. Great. But if you don't want to, you want to get other work done. Arch is a horrible pick because you have to do everything. Nothing's done for you. Them, right? So, but you really don't need to separate them. Sometimes I write a nice article. Sometimes I, I don't. It's just they're all Zettel size and they need to, one needs to overtake the other one, right? But they need to both exist. And those, that information needs to be in the, in, in the document. <gasps> if you're using Arch, you must, you must have a love for anime girls as well. Paper to use Arch. <laughs> I use Arch and love anime, by the way. <laughs> One Punch Man is not anime, noob. <laughs> Your wife flew on the background. Thing. You can always do a virtual machine. You know, the virtual machine is so easy. Uh, Arch even has a container, right? So you put Docker on, Docker on there, Docker, and you can you can do that. You can just do that, right? Uh, you know, I think you could do it. The update the website is really really old. Uh, that actually that website's going to be the new center for all things. Uh, from the boost, the skill stack is going to be the sponsor for the boost, uh, even though I'm skill stack. <laughs> so that's going to change. No one-on-one -on -one mentoring anymore. Uh, it's just not the proper. The reason I'm not doing the one-on-one -on -one thing anymore is not only uh, was it the logistics of getting people and dealing with them one-on-one, -on -one, remote and all that stuff, uh, but the level of impact, uh, the amount of people that I can help out there, um, and uh, the requirement for me to be connected with the industry by having a job in the industry which I think is key. You know, I'm really glad for all the work I did at Skillstack and I met a lot of wonderful people and everything. I don't regret it for one second. I really miss it. Um, the, the, one of the really blatant things I've observed is that, is that I was disconnected from the industry for eight years. So being in the industry every day and sharing it on Twitch makes me more Envim, valuable. If they use Envim. You know, look, I go rail on Envim on myself. If you want to use Envim, fine, use Envim. Just don't make yourself useless. If you want to make yourself useless, that's fine. That's your choice too. Do it. It's not that I hate Envim. I just think that people shouldn't use Envim without knowing Vim. They should know it before they discard reasons. it. They don't even know what a filter is. They say, what's the Unix philosophy? They have no idea what it is. And it's like, it's like, oh, I don't like Vim. I like Envim. Well, how, have you tried it? Have you eaten your green beans? How do you know you don't like green beans? I don't. I tried them. You know what I mean? You got to try it first. You have to really, truly understand VI before you make yourself completely if irrelevant. You files from host to container for practical applications. Well, I, I believe you should mount it. And I, I think you know what that means. Um, and let me see if I can show you what I mean by that. Um, uh, what's the best architecture for sharing files across the container? I actually wrote a script about this. You can go find it in my uh, scripts in my dot files, rbxrob slash dot slash scripts. And it's called WS for workspace. And what I did is I made a workspaces directory on my desktop there to, uh, so that you can, you can, you know, I can, I automatically mount it, uh, from this script and you can go right down here and read it. And, um, you know, and it puts things in there. It sets up my default, uh, user IDs. So my user ID numbers match. Those are all annoyances with Docker as a workspace. Docker as a workspace very much anymore. Uh, I use Mac from the command line. Uh, I use WSL2 and I use uh, a VM when needed because I need to do things there. This is a big thing, like, you know, this Docker socket. So I, I can't fully recommend Docker. We had to set up file sharing over NFS or some sort of exported file system uh, over Docker is going to, I mean, it takes more to set up, but it's going to be better for you in the long run because you're going to be more prepared to work in a Kubernetes environment or, or to just use SSH into Learned things. Russian in college, that was my, uh, and French actually, I went on a French mission to the Caribbean islands and learned Creole there as well. So I guess four languages a little bit, uh, Russian and French pretty well. English is my native and then Creole and stuff. I, I created a company in college called Sterling Scholastic Aids 
and I would make Russian root uh, flashcards and flashcards for the Spanish department. And I would sell those to people because it was easier than making them yourself, even though making them is a part of the learning process. It was sometimes to tedious. This, that I got back into languages and programming, uh, it was the language, language and linguistics department where I wrote hypercard programs to do tutorials and language that I got back into really heavily into coding after kind of giving it up during my, my senior years in high school. I have always had it just use my shell that I'm logged into. So maybe your login shell needs to be changed, your default login shell. I've never had that problem. I don't think there's any way to set it in here. Uh, we need to figure out how that's affecting you, whether it's on Bash or whether it's skill from scratch, like when do you know anything about it and you're struggling and when and how do you get to the point of understanding and finally mastering how do you do that? It, that's, a, that's a big conversation. That's, like a, that's one of the things we cover during almost an entire day uh, during the boost. Um, it's hard to summarize, but if you're going to break it down, just mess with it. Fail with it all the time. You know, do broken things uh, and do that. And the more you mess with it, the, the more you'll know. And manage it in this, in this, in, by looking at the tasks. the tasks. Then you can look at a job or an occupation and you can, you can approach your learning from what do I need to know to do this job based on what skills I need so I can perform a specific task with specific Somebody metrics. If you're doing for that particular position, then you know right away this is how this job is done. And then you can fill in all the gaps. And the more tasks that you outline from a particular occupation, the more you know what you need to do. Uh, and I think it's probably worth that noting. Is the impetus behind the open uh, credential merit system, uh, OCMS, Occam's, because the biggest challenge to learning for most people, particularly in the tech field, is knowing what to learn. It's not that they can't learn it. They just don't know what to learn and they don't know when they've mastered it. So they need Create to have that uh, metrics by which people can measure themselves so they can do the self-assessment and feel confident without having to go to somebody else, which is the traditional form of education where everybody wants to create dependencies between you and the mentor or the teacher so that you pay them or whatever. You're writing the outline know. is not only to kind of hold your hand and be right there with you and pair program with you and help you have the confidence to do it next to you. Not, I'm not looking down on you, you know, we're a mentor, we're just pair programming, but it's also creating that list of what you need to learn for this job. Uh, I've asked this question a lot before, but I'll answer it again. So what do I think of, of Z shell fish and et cetera? Uh, bash is a default shell. So there you go. Uh, the only place it's not the default shell is Kali Linux and Mac. And that's, you know, now up to you to tell me why I should not use the default. Me, why I should leave the default for Linux. The burden of of proof of, of value is on the people trying to get me to not use the thing that is the standard shell on millions, if not trillions of devices already. The question here is like, who does the highlights on the stream on YouTube? Those are great. I am the one doing the highlights. And one of the reasons that I moved to Windows is so that I could use Streamlabs. Streamlabs has a new thing called Media... Uh, sorry, called clips, and you just you can save a replay. It will stitch them together and publish it to YouTube all for uh, you. But I would welcome a sponsorship from them at this point because they are such fucking amazing software. I can sit here and do these things. The little countdown timer down in the corner that goes from 20 to zero, that's the amount of time I have to get a clip in. And as soon as it hits to zero, I just hit the button if I want to save that clip and stitch them together. I'm good. Um, so, so, so Og has been one of our uh, most advocating... People in AFK Works, Association for Federated Knowledge Workers, ask uh, this question about command box since it's getting 1.0. Uh, what comes next? That's a good question. The work that we're doing for the Knowledge Exchange Grid, or KEG, is really core to, it's only secondary to the boost content. So the answer is, it depends on the boost. I I don't want to begin KEG and K-On work uh, until I have the boost outline, boost outline done. Uh, we'll start to move into to that area. However, part of the boost content is having content to read. And right now my Zet is unreadable because it's at like 1300 or, or so entries. So it needs to go to the web. We need to make a thing for that. And what will that be? Uh, that, you know, we'll probably make, we'll probably start making a command, probably K or KN, I don't know which one to use, that will generate 
uh, as you know, stuff from a Zettelcast, and I don't even know how all this is going to play together. But we need something that turns it into a website. website. And I made lots of things that turn it into a website before using just Pandoc and stuff, and we have parsers now. So, I mean, I know how to do this, and I, I've done it a few times before. I know what I want out of it, but I don't want to make just another static site generator with just another blog thing. I want it to be tied into Keg. So. I wanted to do it to right. Gatsby for a while on the whole GraphQL thing. And then, and then, you know, but compared to Hugo, it just doesn't even touch. It's just not, not good at all. Uh, it's just not any good at all. So I'm so glad you went to Hugo. You can actually write your own pretty easily and go. It's, it's pretty easy because the templating and goes really great. Scope of the boost specifically extended back a snower form, uh, whatever the a is and a B and F, um, which all of the RFCs for the internet are written in. Um, I guess the answer is yes, but just briefly. You know about formal grammars in order to understand language definitions, but the average person out there doesn't need to fully understand them to understand how to get their job done in the tech world, and the boost is primarily about that. So around. Julian's been playing around with Proxmox and Windows 11, believe it or not. Uh, I can't wait to do Proxmox at home. I understand that there is a USB version of Proxmox so you can install it as an OS, kind of like an OS, uh, or you can install it otherwise, other ways. I don't know. I'm looking Proxmox forward to it. is probably going to take a back seat to uh, the Boost stuff for probably most of the year this year. I'm uh, really putting a lot of formality around the Boost content this year, so I'm going to be just going to be taking most of my time. Uh, but after that, when I set up that lab, I'll be using that Proxmox on my old machine so that when I press comma from links, it does open the web browser. You still have to go to it. And it opens it. It doesn't open it. It opens it in the browser, but it doesn't switch to the browser, which I actually like better. Uh, that is all in my open command, my revised open command, which is in Perl. It's in my... You're like yeah, wondering what the hell we're talking about. There's a type 1 and a type 2 hypervisor. These are the things that emulate a virtual machine. And type 1 is supposed to run on the hardware, and type 2 is supposed to be an emulation of a machine that runs more on the software layer. But then there's things that blur the lines between those two, like it's running inside of the kernel... And, you know, therefore the kernels on the hardware means that they, some people call it. In fact, we just saw like Red Hat says it's a type one and this person down here says it's a type two. So kind of, as I said, it kind of blurs the lines and makes it hard to get the straight answer about what's what. It combines with the, you know, the kernel for Windows to, to work. And KVM is, is kind of combined with the kernel uh, to work for Linux. So those go together uh, in the comparison of how stuff works. Um, I think that's probably a good enough explanation of that. <laughs> You're going to trust somebody about what a thing is related to the kernel. You know, Red Hat's a better source than most of the others since they are so close to the kernel. Um, whatever else you think about them. And they say that a type one is a system that is bare naked and can run anything. It doesn't need anything to run the VM. Used to master algorithms and see if that's for sure the thing that you think you need to do uh, and you want to do it, then my favorite book so far that I've started, I haven't finished it. I've only worked through a little bit of it is this one from Kyle Ludon, which is very practical, and it's about mastering algorithms, data structures in C, which doesn't happen well, by default. That is because it doesn't get into all the theory and stuff, and it just dumps, jumps you right into like making projects and doing stuff that, that, that matters. It's a very old book. It's been around for a while, and, and it's my favorite. If you're going to do data structures and algorithms, though, you might want to look around for other stuff to as say well. About, you really shouldn't listen to anything I have to say about data structures and algorithms because I haven't done it. I've only done it when I've needed to do it. I don't have any formal CS training. I've never done a whiteboard interview and never will do a whiteboard interview. I think they're completely pointless. I don't think you should be hired based on your lead coding rank. Uh, there's other things that make more of a difference. Learning C is because, and learning C is because C doesn't come with all that stuff. C doesn't even come with hash maps, you know, it, you know, dictionaries in Python. It doesn't have it. So you have to make all of that. I mean, there's libraries for it, but, but that makes it more valuable to learn those kind of things, in my opinion. At, at all, uh, Python's a really good one too. It has it all, you know, batteries included kind of situation. Uh, Go has got a lot of that too. Go is kind of a nice happy medium between Python and C. Uh, that's exactly what it was designed to do. You might try that as well. I, I, I haven't read any books on that at all. As far as Java goes, you're going to be learning a lot of Java in any in any situation, educational situation, because that's the language they use. I, I don't grumble about it as much as I used to because it is a statically typed language, which means you're going to learn about types and stuff at great pain and suffering, but you'll be better off for it. As much as I don't end. like Java, I coded Java officially. I was hired at IBM to do Java. Um, as much as I don't like it for how verbose and unnecessarily ugly it is, 
it does still have application in the mobile space and most enterprise software is still written in Java. So you'll at least know how to port it to something else like Go. Fantastic first language to learn to learn how your computer works and everything. But a lot of people don't have that luxury. And so I don't do it as a first language. First thing we learn is Bash and then, and then we learn some Python and then some Go. And, and eventually we'll learn some C uh, after, by talking about it in context of Go. Yeah. A better version of C. They even said, you know, a, a friendlier C. That was the mantra, like the tagline for Go for years. And, and those people, some of them were inv originally invented with the design of C with Richie back in the day. So I trust the creators of Go to do that. And I think it's a good I language for that. This is the Bible. It's, this book cost me, I think, like $130. It's the Corman, Lesterson, Rivest, Stein book. It's the standard textbook for algorithms, and it has all of the pseudocode, and it's not language-specific, and all those things you mentioned. It's also shit. Because it is, because it's built, it's written by academics to, for college boards to approve so they can force it on students without any consideration for the readability and consumability of the product. It's a perfect example of everything that's wrong with academic writing and academic institutions. They don't give a shit about the people they're trying to teach. They want to impress the people they're going to give them their money and force the book on them. You can't design a new version of a thing until you know what you're designing. So the reason that's important to me is because the document web, I think, is shit. It's gone to complete shit. The original reason for the web being created has become total shit. So... I mean, it's really hard for anybody to answer the question without knowing what kind of thing you're talking about. What kind of web are we talking about here? You know, and, and I think the documentation web, the document web, the original intent is, is completely dead. And it needs to be re completely redone from the ground up without any blockchain at all. It just distributed. I've actually done a lot of work on this, the thinking on this on the knowledge exchange grid about how that would work. And you could even use GPG to encrypt the data and store it. You wouldn't need any medium for transport. I mean, any method of transport at all besides USB stick, if even if you wanted to. It's about the content being king. And that's that's what I think is a better way to it's do it. It's completely uh, divorced from any specific way of storing the data or sharing the data. It doesn't matter. However you share the data, it doesn't matter. The network is whatever you have available, including sneakers and people and libraries and stuff besides we've the network. Distribution. We've already done distributed networks, right? We've got BitTorrent and every one of those things like it. We, we already have done peer-to-peer -peer sharing. We don't need blockchain for that. If it's just a matter of sharing the data with everybody and making sure everybody gets it, that, that tech's already been covered and there's no fucking blockchain involved. involved. So, no, Rust is a horrible DevOps language. Why would you learn Rust for that? Name one application that's ever been written in Rust that matters. There's nothing. The entire cloud world, Kubernetes, Helm, everything is all written in Go. Learn Go if you want to do DevOps. Spoken by that's someone it. who actually deals with embedded programming. Hearing VMT say Rust is extremely close to the middle of programming. Only JavaScript programmers who want to mess around with some ARM chips. That is pretty much it. That is why Rust is so, quote, popular. This is a joke. I know this is a joke, but... It's not as funny. I've had people threaten my life over the Rust shit in in uh, back channel Twitter and stuff like that after I made that video on YouTube. So the Rust community is the most toxic community I have ever experienced. They're out of They're, control. You know, I can bag on Rust. It doesn't mean that I don't like you as a human being. <laughs> it doesn't mean I'm going to stalk you or find you in your sleep. Hey, honey, my wife just came home. I got beer. Oh, you did get beer? It's the Super Bowl. We have to drink beer. All right. All right. It is a sauna. I can't believe they would do that. I can't believe it. Sock garters for the win. So uh, micro Kates is what is in Rancher desktop and it is a pain in the butt. It doesn't work. Rancher desktop doesn't work. Um, so my choice is to use a VM with Docker and Kubernetes actually in it that I've built myself. Uh, it's just more stable and it's more real. The entire cloud native world is written in Go. So it's the most relevant language of, of the modern era other than a web language, particularly for infrastructure engineering. Um, and also just awesome. It's written by Rob Pike and 
uh, Gressemer, Rob Gressemer, and Ken Thompson, who made Unix and C and Unicode and all kinds of amazing things. A lot more than that. Uh, Go is cross-compiled. Uh, it's just really, really clean. It has a super unsexy syntax that allows you to get work done. And it does just enough for you. It doesn't do too much. It's got integrated uh, JSON on marshalling and marshalling and a billion other things. It's a true thing that it's always been fantastic at. That's the reason it was invented. Replace awk, right? And it never gets the fucking credit for that. It is still, hands down, the best. Every other language uses PCRE, which is pro compatible regular expressions. They've defined the standard. Is face value or is syntax like PHP? They compare it. They try to compare it to Python or PHP for enterprise programming or web development. I'm like, no, that's not the fuck that you're not doing it right. That is not what Perl is for. It just happened to be used as a web language because it was the best fucking language on planet Earth besides C and Bash. But I'm going to do it right now. You want it, you know what's better than said? Pi. There's my pi. And the only thing it is, I could type this out, Perl P-I-E dash if I wanted to, but I don't need to. I don't need to, and it's just better. It's a thousand times better than said. Said is one of the main reasons it was made. So first of all, I'm going to use the commas. You guys know about this, right? This works for said too. If you, if you, the, whatever the first character is after the S, it will use that as a delimiter. So if you want to like match slashes, which I do, then you can use a comma instead. All right, you got that? Misunderstand. I am not using dash I dot back and making backup copies of all the files because I have git. Anytime I'm scared about that shit, I make sure it's all git, so, and then I can do a git diff and see what I fucked up. Then I can do so you get git pull it. So you, you don't need the backup files if you're using git. And then I'm just looking at the git diff to see what it did change. By the way, always git commit before you do that. And then you can like look at what every file, like very in excruciating detail, you can do a git diff and you can see how everything changed. It's a great technique to 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 make sure you didn't screw something up. So there's 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 map. Um there's uh PAE. And you might want to look at the commands and see if you understand them uh before you run them so you know what you're doing. They're they're pretty powerful. Um it's not that many extra keystrokes. By the way, people compare Py and Perl to Python all the time. I'm like, on when it comes to one liners, Perl fucking destroys Python for one-liners and it always has and it always will because python doesn't give a shit about that python is more of an enterprise object-oriented language Oops. I, long and short of it first of all i hate the the design i hate that it's like killing my eyes <laughs> they could have done the same thing in html or css or something but they made a big old diagram and that's fine uh, i don't put that down for them i, I do like I it put everything in this dog on there uh and a lot of this stuff doesn't need to be here I would need to go through and break down the whole thing. The short answer is just set up Kubernetes on your own virtual machines and kind of forget this. Paint strokes there, right? So, so you know, if you're going to go into, first of all, DevOps and oper infrastructure operations are not the same thing. They're not. DevOps and, op DevOps and operations are not the same thing. That's why it's called DevOps. So... In the developer operations integration, DevOps right? is applying software development to operations. SRE is applying software development to system sustainability. And it's true. It's totally true. I mean, that, there's, that's very succinct. I don't really need to add anything to that. That's really, really well stated. Um, and, and, and that's it. You need to know the difference and know what you're getting into. <laughs> Who won the Super Bowl? Who gives a shit? <laughs> that's my answer. I really don't give a shit about the Super Bowl. In fact, football is killing kids. It's destroying their brains. Even Mike Ditka oh, said so. Book. I think uh, William Schatz is a fantastic author. He's got a really great style and readability. Uh, he's also a very solid um, person just in general. And I really, really like it. I, unfortunately, uh, the Linux command line, which is free, by the way, don't buy it, is, is also very old. But it's still relatively up to date. Let's go through and do that. Um, so... Chris literally wrote the book on cloud native infrastructure <laughs> or shall we say one book on it. So we're great, really great. Have, grateful to have uh, Chris here with us and to be able to uh, look at the PDF and review it online, which we will do. Um, I do what's called bimodal sleep schedule. That means I sleep twice a day, usually uh, for more than, you know, two or three hours. And then I, I have two periods of, of good brain activity when I wake up. Uh, you can read about that in my set, but that's command line. Here we go. 
So what I do is I do this. I open links with a command line browser and I send it the URL and I build up the URL from the command line and that's it. And then uh, I have an alias that's tied to duck so I can just do this and then it passes it as the first arguments. That's I actually all. love it because you can actually search your search history uh, from the command line. You can look through whatever it was you searched for, you know, like the last time I searched for Golang or whatever, and you can find, see all the search histories? Now the search history is a part of my command history, which I can edit with VI at any time, which is amazing. So this Twitch ad break thing, where you click on the three minute ad break, it, when you do that, it actually stops any starting pre-roll ads for 33 minutes. So people coming into your stream can immediately start seeing something instead of being forced to watch an ad. So you're going to see ads no matter what's on Twitch, but if you do this, you can control the ads. I suggest that if you want to control the ads on your channel, you should take a break every 30 minutes and god knows we need to take breaks every 30 minutes to get up and walk around i've been taking 40 minute breaks but this makes me think that no we should take a 30 minute break and specifically 33 minutes actually but if we take a 30 minute break and then the three minutes of overlap is going to cover it i just i think it's so important that we fully understand this because as an educator you want to control when people can see your content and when they can't and, and if it's going to automatically interrupt you in the middle of an important point that someone's going to miss, then I'm willing to take a break every 30 minutes to control when the ads appear. There is an ad block thing you can do on Twitch. You can do through the API or you can go to their to their interface and you can just click on take an ad break for three minutes. And every, when you do, you get you automatically get 30 minutes of no interruption. And this prevents people from being interrupted in the middle while you're trying to do something. Explaining code like somebody explained here to somebody or being in the middle of a lesson or something like that and explaining a really difficult point and having Twitch randomly stick an ad in your face at that moment. Well, you can control that as long as you take 30 minute ad breaks and you make sure to click the ad break button because you take full control of the ads instead of Twitch. We're gonna starting, we're gonna, we're gonna shift over to com command box to go 1.18. We're gonna add generics to the utility library um, just cause. And it, so first things first, we're gonna put 18 here and we're gonna do an installation on that. We no longer have a YAML dependency, thank God. So that's so what's awesome. coming. Oh my God, this is so awesome. I can't believe they have this. This is replaces go replacing. Remember when we like working on multiple modules and you used to have to put the replace directive in and then the replace directive would break because you'd leave it in and you'd commit and nobody could install. They they added a thing called go work to fix all that. Oh my God. So users often want to make changes across multiple modules. For instance, when introducing a new interface in a package in one module and they want to do the other one, so they're working on things together, before you would use the replace directive, right? It allows users to replace the resolve, blah, 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 right? But then it would break. It would break all the time. So they fixed that. They fixed this. How the fuck did I miss this? I missed this amazing fix that they did. I have been wanting this fix forever. Congratulations, Go Team. Oh my God, Go Team, you are amazing. You're amazing for adding this. Thank you so much for adding this. Oh my God, this is so fucking cool. I, you just have this go.work file. Instead of using replace directives, you put use here and it'll say, hey, use this stuff. And as long as there's a go work file there, it'll work. But then when you do a go, when you do a git commit, when you do a git commit, you can put that in your git ignore and you can ignore it. Something like that. I'm very, I'm very much that guy. <laughs> I am so excited about about Go Open 18. You have no idea. I am like bursting at the seams from this Go Open 18 stuff. It's so stinking cool. Oh, I I, I should probably calm down. I, I'm not I'm not I'm not slamming you, Lee or Lama. I just I I wonder why people do that. I think it's because they want it to look cool and everything, you know. But then their stuff can't be found by Google, so it defeats the whole purpose of being on the web in the first place. Gonna be good for my health. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to be doing push-ups every 20 minutes now, every 30 minutes. I mean, who knew, who knew that ads were going to be good for me? <laughs> I think it's great. All of command box. And the best way to see what the end result is going to look like is to go to the foo, the template. So template slash command box and look there. Uh, and this is what it'll take to make a command. And do the new That's one... Great. There is no init time anymore. There is no more um, runtime anything. <laughs> it's all built in. So it should be way crazy, crazy faster. And, and it's just as elegant and clean. So we're going to keep that.